Hey, hi guys. Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. This is Sander de Bruin, now live streaming from Amsterdam in the Netherlands again. Uh, so together with my friends, uh, Gordon, we are inviting you and we are help, welping, welcoming you to today's another Crypto Wednesday show. And we are really excited and we are excited every week, but especially this week, because we have, I think, one of the most proactively participating industry friends in the show, who's, who's I, I think, Gordon, this guy is going to take over from us today. And this is our dear friend. And I mean this from the bottom of my heart. This is Marco, Marco Anibali. We really appreciate it because every week you are here. Every week you're not only showing up, but you're contributing, you know, you're involvement in the discussion so we're really happy to uh, to have you on the show now also and you invited some of your friends as as panelists so before i hand over to you before we hand over to you marco maybe gordon you give uh, the audience a quick uh, review you, i think you're still in la right we don't need to repeat yeah, that every, every, well i'll just say when i'm not in los angeles and i'm broadcasting for a place closer to you i i'll, I'll be dancing you, you can tell because i'll be dancing but yes at the <laughs> moment i'm in studio city california uh, home of the undecided election. And just real quick, yes, I'm a lawyer who specializes in cryptocurrency and blockchain. And I, you know, Sandra and I started this up several months ago. Um, Marco has been fantastic. He's, I'm working with him on a few projects, actually. Very sharp mind, very good guy. Um, and his involvement with Crypto Wednesdays, both as someone who kind of shows up and asks you questions and is provocative as a general alumni speaker, is vast and appreciated and i know that i'm not gonna steal his thunder i know the topic that he assembled this demo for is something very close and dear to his heart something he's been working on a lot um my intention like i mentioned in the pre-show is to kind of step back during this but it's such an interesting topic i may break in we'll see um Zana, do you want to get the quick yeah about, about questions Zoom bombing and all that other good stuff yeah maybe for the new people so so for example last week we had a few uh, strange guests let's put it like that some zoom bombers so if there are any zoom bars here or coming in we get them out we give them a, a big laugh you know and wish them a, a good life uh, but in the meantime the first part of the show for everybody that's, that's attending the live show if you have any questions or comments or whatsoever please put it in the chat box uh, for the first part we will close also the videos for the for the non-speakers and the second part of the show we open up the mics you know you can get into the to the conversation you can ask marco or his his friends some questions or some re remarks. So uh, maybe before we really go to Marco, Gordon, maybe it's good that you intro Marco because you brought him to the table. Um, uh, well, I, I, yeah. well, just you know, I, I think I kind of did, but I'll put it this way. I vouch for him in the mafia sense. <laughs> but you know, let, let, let's just start up. Let's just start up and hand it to Marco. Marco, introduce yourself and your co-panelists and just go for it. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Well, Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to your, uh, actually, I find it an awesome way to spend my Wednesday mornings. Uh, there's always provocative people. There's always topics that are interesting and much to my enjoyment. I love the idea that there's nothing too focused about the discussions because we tend to diverge uh, a lot of times and we diverge into very interesting topics. Uh, so, I've been working on uh, decentralized, <clears throat> self-sovereign digital identity, <clears throat> which I said backwards, self-sovereign decentralized digital identity, SSDDID, um, for a couple of years now, um, mostly in the conceptual phase, trying to find a model that would actually work. And I'm going to present that, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to present uh, just a very high level conceptual framework that I think has what it takes to make this work globally and <clears throat> excuse me again one second don't you even know, start Gordon. You know, while you're recovering along i want to give a shout out to sergey uh and <laughs> elizabeth they're they're alumni speakers joining us from moscow i believe and sergey has a great show on monday called think tank that i you know he's nice enough to invite me on on occasion you know schedules don't always allow but he wanted, he specifically made a point of joining in on this because it's a topic that's near and dear to his heart. So Sergey, obviously, you know, during the alumni speaker portion, there'll be more active back and forth, but I'm, I'm just giving, I'm giving you a wave while Marco recovers. Okay, okay. okay. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Well, thank you. Sergey, I'm looking forward to it. Definitely. 
Uh, in fact, that's the, the, the my my idea theoretically here behind this whole conf- this this discussion is to have as many people as possible, starting with Luke, uh, who's had many discussions with me on this con- on this topic, and Alex, who I met through the D4A conference, who is also deeply involved. This is not a technical discussion. We're gonna we're gonna make a lot of assumptions about what tech exists, and we're gonna look at this from a how does this work socially, economically, compliance, legally, all that fun stuff, and get right into that. And with that, um, anybody who wants to find out who I am and what I'm about, you can go look at my LinkedIn profile. It's just LinkedIn slash IN slash Annabally. And that's spelled out for you right there in the uh, participants list. So go right ahead and have a look there if you want to know more about me. Um, I'm, uh, as I said, uh, Gordon mentioned, involved in several projects, uh, uh, a couple of DAOs uh, to begin with, and also uh, I run a blockchain software development uh, uh, company uh, where we work mostly on core blockchain rather than on smart contracts and things. Uh, And with that, I'm going to let Luke and Alex uh, introduce themselves. Uh, Luke, why don't you take the first one? Sure. My name is Luke Stokes. I'm the managing director for the Foundation for Interwallet Operability. We're trying to make cryptocurrency easier to use. And part of that component is a human readable identifier. So I, like Luke at Stokes is a handle that you can have on the field protocol. So it kind of connects into identity and Marco has been doing some really cool stuff. He was kind enough to ask me to participate. Uh, I guess I'm just really loud and opinionated. So I find myself in being asked to participate. Uh, would not at all consider myself uh, an expert in identity because I haven't really done anything officially in the space like my other uh, esteemed colleagues. However, uh, I, I do like to think about these from an ethical, philosophical, moral perspective and how it can impact the world. And you know, I do think it's gonna be built. And so we gotta figure out how to do it right. So thank you, Marco, for having me. I really appreciate being here. Awesome. And Alex. Hi, hi, everyone. So my name is Alex. I'm based in Barcelona, and, and I'm involved in self sorting and SSI for the last three years, I would say. Like I started uh, funding, uh, I'm the founder of an association in Spain that's called Alastria. It was quite, quite successful at the time. We had around 500 companies joining in to build some kind of public infrastructure for self sorting identity in Spain. So there are a lot of movements here, and even politicians, they talk about it, about that. But then all of the big companies came in and uh, it became some kind of digital lobby at the point. Anyway, I, 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 I'm building, I'm coding. So that's what I do. I code uh, standards and I code uh, basically a solution for processes in top of SSI. So basically nobody wants blockchain. That's something I learned. Nobody buys digital identity also. So it's quite hard to sell. So basically we're selling some kind of RBA. And if it has like blockchain in the back and SSI, nobody cares. <laughs> okay, thank you, Alex. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to kick this off. Alex and Luke have already seen this. Um, and I'm just going to play around with my Zoom interface here uh, and share a little, very short uh, slide deck. So just for clarification for everybody, I'm assuming everyone can see it because I can see it on my second screen. Um, You're good, it's visible. Self-sovereign, yeah, self-sovereign. Let's make sure we all understand self-sovereign means that you are in control of you, okay? That's the key point uh, about self-sovereign anything is that you are in control of everything that is related to you. Um, Decentralized. Uh, and digital, everyone understands what digital is, uh, and decentralized for the purposes of this conversation, because it's a very contentious word these days <laughs> about what is the definition of decentralized. It means that there is no center. Okay, so there is no there is no center of this infrastructure that we're talking about uh, implementing here. This is a thing that has. The center is you. You are the center of this thing. And your neighbor across the street is the center of theirs. And Alex is the center of his. And Gordon is the center of his. Um, And the only center is the self. And then, of course, identity. So we're presenting a uh, conceptual model here, very, very high level, 
uh, with the assumption that the technology exists, we just haven't assembled it correctly yet. And we're going to talk about uh, from this model, ideally, what are the problems and are there, are there situations where it completely falls flat in its face, in which case we're going to throw this out the window and start talking about other things. So the model is basically designed to, I'm just waiting for the rest of the screens to catch up. There we go. Um, there are two components. There's a core and there's the edges. In the core, you have what everybody fears. You are assigned a number. <laughs> In this case, the number is what you probably commonly have seen if you play around with blockchains very much. You've seen an address. And it's a very long string of gobbledygook that you don't really know what it means, but it's a fact, in fact, a unique identifier for you. The core's design is that everything is secret. The, when you are connected to the core, you're the only person who can see your stuff and you can't see anybody else's stuff. All you can see is yours. But the infrastructure is a single infrastructure that is decentralized. In other words, copies of it are stored all over the planet. So it's always redundant. No one, you can never lose the data, but the only thing you can see in it is your record. And that acts as what the, the uh, W3C uh, has decided to call a DID, a digital identity. But all it says about you is that you are unique and that's it. You are unique and this is your system's name, if you will. You never share it with anybody. You never tell anybody what it is. Uh, you keep it secret for your entire life. There's no need to share it. Uh, no one should ever know what it is. And then we get into the next stage. This is what goes on outside the core. And outside the core, all of these circles, with the exception of the middle one, think of them as blockchain applications. All right, each one's a separate one. And each one sets up a relationship between your DID, your, your secret number, and somebody else's secret number. And when it does that, it creates a new secret number that is unique to just the relationship between you two. And you can have thousands of these things. And in fact, if you think about how you live your life, you already do have thousands of relationships. You just don't think of them that way. What we're talking about here with respect to uh, digital identity, if you, think, if you look at it from what your perspective would look like, it would look like this, except a lot wider. Each blue box there is a relationship. The red box underneath it represents the unique identifier that uniquely identifies the fact that you and someone else have a relationship. And it is not decodable. No one can figure out who the two parties are, but it is there. And it's always the same. So if you say join Facebook, you'll get this unique relationship ID. And then if you quit Facebook and come back five years later, you will still have the same relationship ID and Facebook will know that you're the same person that quit five years ago. Sorry, Marco, can I ask you a question? Sure, please. You're describing the world as it is now or as it is under a platform you're proposing or disorient me a little bit? Uh, a, frame, a framework I'm proposing. Okay, so this is- Because this, this is not the way the world is now. Facebook doesn't know if you show up and write it, sign up another account that it's the same you from five weeks ago. Okay. Got it. So this, okay. So th this is, okay. So this is because there, there's some aspects of this that seem to map to present reality, but you're, you're presenting in a sort of more structured high, high level view. Is, is that fair to say? Exactly. Exactly. That's the goal uh, here. Okay. Go so ahead. you can see you've got, for example, your Amazon relationship, you would have a pseudonym. You, there's no need to give them your real name. They have no use for it and no actual legal requirement to have it per se. And, and they the need prior, to know your age. Of, sorry, on the prior slide where you had the core, can you go back one slide? I just did. Is, is there's a slight, um, slight delay. Lag. 
So digital identity. Okay, now I, I, again, this, this is proposed or this is sort of mapping the way things are now. Well, funny enough, this is the way things are now. If you take digital ID out there and put in your full name, address, phone number, and uh, passport photo and utility bill for the DID. Got it. And then uh, what does the core represent? The core represents the repository of all digital identities, which are keys. Okay. Right. And this is just pulling out an example. Got it. From it. Okay. Thank you. We're good. Thank you. So I was just saying, uh, you're you're on to the, the the next slide here. We're talking about what what it would look like to you in your world of looking at your digital identity. You would see a whole bunch of relationships that you have. And each of those relationships would have a unique identifier that only you and the person you have the relationship with know. And then within that unique identifier, if you have access to that relationship ID, you would be able to see all the stuff you've disclosed or done with that particular person or, or company, in the, whatever the case may be. And those become things that represent part of who you are. So you have your DMV in there where you get the, you know, your name, your date of birth, your residence, your testing status for your driver's license. So whether your license is suspended or not, and what's the expiry date, all that data is tied to that relationship between you and the DMV, but only you and the DMV can see it, but you are free to share it with other people. If they say, I want to know that you have a driver's license, you can now for formally claim, yes, I do. And here's the relationship ID that proves it in one scenario. In, the, in a scenario where the, the whole platform is reasonably trusted by the rest of the world, they wouldn't even need to know the relationship ID. They would just need to know that the platform says, yes, you have a driver's license and here's the jurisdiction it's in. And we can get into a whole ton of detail on this, but I'm, I'm trying not to <laughs> um, because it can get pretty crazy. Um, I'm going to actually pop a copy of this into the uh, in, in, over to you, Gordon, and you can share it out to the to the the channel, um, so everyone can have a copy and ask questions. I, I suppose uh, if they want, um, and I'll do that right after I finish this last slide. <laughs> um, and the title says it all. Identity is the collection of all of this. Currently, when we think of identity, we think of our driver's license, our birth certificate, our passport. That's our identity, right? Those are just relationships we have, right? Our birth certificate is our relationship with the government at the date we were born. And our passport is our relationship with our, with our uh, chosen government or governments, if you have more than one passport, um, that uh, state that this is your relationship with the government at the time it was issued. And your driver's license is the same thing. It's a relationship with wherever it is you are legally allowed to drive at the time you passed your test until blank uh, years later when you have to get it renewed. And that's all it does, right? Um, what, we're, what I'm proposing here and what a lot of people in the world are, are, are coming to is that your identity actually should be tied to all the things you do that are identifiable things that have meaning in the world. And that includes things like, who are your friends? Who's your family? Who, what, who are your employers? Uh, what governments are you registered with? And for what reasons? Are you, a ta are you taxable here? Are you uh, a citizen of here, but you don't live there? Uh, are, are you, can you drive in multiple countries? Uh, do you have Amazon accounts in multiple countries? Uh, all of that stuff, collectively, the whole collection of it is your identity. And it brings into play the concept that your identity cannot be taken away from you in a self-sovereign situation. The US government can pull away your passport and say, no, you're stateless. And in most people's case, that makes you unidentifiable. In a world where identity is the collection of all the things you've done and all the things you, you can do and do do, you're removing the passport from your identity does not delete your identity. It just deletes one component of it. And that component is only inactive. 
you're still recognized that the U.S. government recognized you for being who you are. They just decided to stop recognizing you for some reason or other. It doesn't change the fact that you were recognized by any number of border control stations as you pass through with your driver's li- with your passport. It doesn't mean that you don't have a bank account. It doesn't mean you, you can't get another bank account because a bank will just look at it and go, well, regardless of your whole passport thing, we know you're a great customer at these four banks. And so why shouldn't we be a, uh, a service provider to you too? And I know we're getting into some real fun legal stuff there, Gordon, <laughs> but I sort of wanted to just wrap this whole thing up. Your identity is the collection of everything that you have a relationship with in the world, not just a government. Okay, interesting. You, you know what, James Hap, who is on this call now, made a comment to me yesterday, which I thought was kind of funny. He said, well, you know, do you remember the first thing you learned in property class in law school? And we actually were thinking of two separate things. Um, I, I, the, my, my answer was that property rights are really, or property is really just a bundle of rights that you can, like a bunch of twigs, like tied together or fasces, or, you know, you can take any one of them out and assign it, like the right to license or the right to possess or the right to use whatever. And it's a bundle of rights. You're making an interesting analogy in my mind between that and uh, identity sort of being a bundle of relationships. So it's an interesting insight to say your driver's license or your birth certificate is a relationship to your government at the time you're born. That's an interesting way of putting it. So. Kudos to you. It, it, uh, it, no, it's, 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 un, it's unfortunate. I want to welcome James Hap. Good to see you. I welcome Sophia. Sophia is pretty much in charge of the Malta Summit. Welcome, Sophia. Sophia, she's here somewhere. And I'm going to hand it back to you. Keep going. Wait, can, I, can I stick All in right. what I stick, like Gordon? Can I stick in what I actually what I, what I said? Which yes, was, please. I was putting words in. Please the, go ahead. Exactly, but the but the, the but the but the core core concept the core concept of of uh, of property law is that I can't take from you what you don't have to give, mm-hmm. uh, and so and that fits in with Marco was saying also uh, in that you know how you create that mosaic of what identifies you, uh, you know, is essential in what people can take from you later. Beautiful. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. And if it's self-sovereign, they can't take it. They can only ask you to release it. All right. right so so anyway, let's let's open this up to your panel because I I, I want to. No, please. I, I love the cross dialogue and I love the fighting. <laughs> so, just, Luke, Luke and Alex, you know, Marco, lead them away. All right. I, I'm sure both of you yeah. have things to say. Uh, shall we start with Alex this time? Alex, you gotta take yourself off. You're muted, Alex. Yeah, unmute yourself yourself and stay unmuted unless there's a dog in the background. Yeah, no, you, you, I have a dog in the background. (laughs) Yeah, I do have. (laughs) I don't have a cat, sorry. Um, But um, I think it's quite complicated. Like when I started thinking about um, self serving identity, uh, uh, then I, the the question was like, what's identity? And it should be quite an easy question. And then I started like learning about it and reading and no, I I think nobody knows. And so basically as as most of the community that's working on SSI like me, we are working on something that nobody knows what it is as as usually. So probably most of us are quite lost when it comes to self-serving identity or what it means. Even there's people that they say that since having identity it's too dangerous because like it can, you can lose your identity and you, then you can lose everything. So um, yes, I do believe, um, first of all, like identity should be controlled by, by people, not by organizations. I think that's a problem with internet. Mm-hmm. Internet was born like a way to share pictures of cats, but not uh, with a real identity. So right now, everybody's digitalizing. Everybody's like getting into the real, into, into the digital world. Most of the companies, they are. And, and, and every time a new company, a new service comes into place, uh, we get a new identity. I, I think usually we have around 70 identities, like each, each one of us. The main thing is like that we have uh, literally 70, 80, maybe 90, a lot of identities, but, but we have control over none of, the, of, of those identities. So basically, um, we need to change them internet we need to decentralize it but in before decentralizing everything we need a better identity system i think ssi could be one of the solutions and basically it means reaching standards amongst all of the people that's building things 
So the model that you presented, uh, Marco, I, th I think it's great. It, it looks like a lot like what, what we're trying to build. Every, every one of us, by the way, a lot of people is, is trying to build that. But um, if we not, if we don't just work together with that and and like what you're doing right now, sharing the model, discussing the model, and then building together the model and the standards, like this is going to be quite complicated. And we are finding a, a big market. There are a lot of, if you go into the digital identity world, I think that the market is five, five or seven billion dollars, something like that. It's huge market. And none of them want to lose control over the market. Probably you ask uh, Google if they want to lose uh, all of their users. Maybe they say that they're they not interested. I'm not, not sure about that. Alex, you know, you said something really? interesting during your original introduction, which is, I think I heard you say you program standards. Did you say that? Yeah, I, I think that standards. To digital identity, what the standards you're programming, and what, what does that mean? It means that um, uh, SSI, you should, uh, there's, there's like a lot of different characteristics for SSI, but uh, a few of them are that should be interoperable and portable. Meaning that uh, no matter what uh, agent or uh, or service I use to store my identity, even I, if I do it myself, I could move my my whole identity from my wallet to another wallet. So we should uh, we should work with the same standards. If not, probably we'll end up building a lot of different services for identity that they are not connected to each other, and it does not make any sense at all. And are so, these standards like ISO standards? Are they? Standards well, the widely accepted. The standards, like, what makes them a standard? The ones you. Uh, I think standard. <laughs> it's that, that everybody like, uses it. Everybody like uses it. That was the standard. <laughs> I don't oh, the, the, the standard to me impl implies some kind of third party uh, certification service or like ISO or something or international address, whatever it is. Just well, that one you've received. Body. It's doing that. Yeah, but W3C right now is working on the standards. There are two big standards for SSI. That's uh, the DITs, the centralized uh, ident uh, identifiers, and the uh, verifiable credentials. So both are standards. And, and I think it's quite important also to, to, to uh, there's a lot of, uh, of work done in the, in the area. Like uh, schema, if you go to schema.org, you, you will see all, all of the work that's been, doing, uh, that's been done on semantic web that we could use, by the way. So the semantic web is a good example of, of a standard that we, we, we could use. But W3C is doing a, a, a big effort. There's, a, there's an, an event that's called Rebooting the Web of Trust. Well, there are a few of them, but Rebooting the Web, the web of Trust that's led, led by Christopher Allen, uh, that basically they're working on that. They are trying to build the standard. The, the main problem is that oh, there's a lot of people building the standards for everything. And then there's a few people coding and usually when you code, you find different problems that when you do a standard, when you do a standard, you think about like globally and all of the problems in the world, but then you code and, and you see that the, probably the problems are completely different. Right, and the thing you bring up, Alex, is, is one of the key things I'm trying to fight against is that there are bodies out there trying to set standards that invariably are digitizing what already exists. Um, and that is the real problem and the thing that we're trying to solve uh, both my internal team and the team at large, if you will, everyone who participates in all the different projects I'm in, um, is, the, is the idea that you're setting, what we want to do is that core piece that I was mentioning before. We want to set a standard for that. But all that is, is your keys, literally the keys or the key ring, if you will, uh, that gets you into all the other types of things. And the concept is not a web of trust. The concept is a web of accountability. How do you distinguish that? Yep. Web, web of trust implies a, uh, it's basically a faith-based model, right? Trust is not a guarantee. You cannot trust somebody 100% ever. Trust is a choice. And you choose to trust somebody. Most people who've lived long enough in this world trust, uh, but verify. <laughs> and, and even after they verified, they trust, but they have a contingency in case their trust is breached. Uh, web of accountability, the concept is that it doesn't matter whether I trust you or not. I know you're accountable. Okay. Right? I'm and that's the key. I mean, right what now. What does that mean then? 
like when you say accountable, you generally people think about uh, like if you look at these different rules for how you do governance, there's like some feature that's going to happen to them. There's some, you know, thing they have to, some risk that they're taking, some kind of, you know, consequence, you know, there's always a different way to say we're enforcing something through that accountability. Otherwise, it's just the same kind of like trust thing, right? Well, yeah, the, the, the nice, lovely thing about uh, immutable um, databases like blockchains uh, is that you can't hide from your, your past. And if you set up a relationship using this model, uh, because you can't fake who you are in the relationship and the other person can't fake who they are in the relationship, when the relationship is formed, you have the option of adding transactional information to that relationship over time. Things like for a driver's license, you renewed it, you renewed it again, you renewed it again, you lost it, you got a new one, all that kind of stuff. But it is fully, uh, you're fully accountable. Both parties are fully accountable to that relationship. So if you go and do something within that relationship context that causes havoc, mayhem, or just sadness, <laughs> whatever, right? Oh, he took 10 bucks from me. Um, that 10 bucks he took from you is on record. You can't walk away from it. And people asking you down the road, I want to see your overall trust rating, which would be calculated by you, by the way, but you wouldn't have any control over it other than how you act. Uh, but when someone says, I need you to disclose your overall trust rating uh, or your overall, um, what's the word? accountability rating, right? All right? When you say you're going to do something, do you do it? Uh, kind of rating that you could build out of that huge web of relationships, but it would be built in software on your self-sovereign control point. But, but, but it can right? be dangerous. Like we don't have a really secure internet right now. So identity can be, can be stolen. Somebody can steal my identity, do things with my identity that, that will, will never be erased, will never be deleted. Right. I it would it be akin to them stealing your Bitcoin wallet off of your phone. Yeah. Not easy. Or long Not long easy, long. but Possible. it can be done. Possible, by the it way. Can, it can be done. In fact, they can't steal it. They can, they can copy it and start acting as you. Hmm. It wouldn't take you very long to figure out that that had happened. Probably, but, but they can do a lot point, of though, on that On that model, if they were to do that, like it breaks every other relationship you've ever had unless they're able to only get access to like one relational ID, right? And, and it, kind of a follow-up question is I'm like, how does this fit in with the DID standard that the Web3 and others are working on? You know, I mean, it, it, we talked a little bit about standards, but we kind of didn't finish that conversation. One of my favorite XKCDs is the one where it's like, why are there 12 standards? You know, we need a single standard to unify all the standards. And of course the last frame is there are now 13 standards. And this is the classic case <laughs> of anyone who's in software, you know, for a decade or two, it's one of my favorite XKCDs because it's like it outlines exactly the situation we're in. You got the DID, you've got, you know, there was a Microsoft Open ID, I mean, or, uh, you know, Google authentication. I mean, there's so many examples of people trying to solve this. Um, and partly, part, partly, I feel like it's just, you know, like the Facebook model of, you know, ship's code wins. Whoever actually deploys a working system, that, that's, the government, that, that's beautiful, by the way. Individuals trust, then I think that one's Ship code win. wins. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Shipped code wins. And to be honest with you, I don't think you could ever package this, this model I'm presenting here. You cannot package it and ship it. It will fail. Hmm. It will fail because too many people will see, they, they will fail because it removes Facebook's ability to cross match its users. It eliminates it. It removes Google's ability to cross match users with other databases. It removes government's ability and the NSA's ability and everything else to cross match users. Uh, and the minute you remove all of that, you've fundamentally shifted the economy of the internet <clears throat> because currently the economy of the internet is all based on grabbing as much information about the users of the internet as possible, segmenting and advertising, 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 and driving, you know, new markets and all those kinds of things based on this data you're able to gather because there's 2 billion people exposing their personal uh, information on, on Facebook in detail. And then there, there's, there's half of those are also exposing it on Google in different forms. And then they're doing stupid things like maybe they're adding uh, their social insurance number to their profile somewhere. And all of a sudden, boom, you can tie that in and oh, it's, it's over the moon. 
this thing has to be deployed in a way that it becomes a, because uh, one of the key things that I didn't talk about here, but from an economic perspective, that core infrastructure <clears throat> that does the, that just keeps your digital ID and the digital ID in this case is the high, the, the root of the W3C spec. It's that ID number and that's it. The rest of the stuff that the W3C wants to see is coming from relationships. It's relationship with the government that gives you your passport. That gives you a whole bunch of those other W3C uh, items now available to you to share once you've gotten that government's agreement that yes, you exist and you are who you say you are, mm -hmm. or a KYC verifier, or a bank, or whatever, right? And those are the things that add the attributes that we all care about. But as you, as I, I was saying in the in the model, you get way more attributes than just those standard sets because you have other things you do that actually help identify you. But that core piece, you literally have to ship it quietly in secret, kind of like what Bitcoin did, sort of, um, and just get it being used by any identity app out there because anybody can build one of those circles on the outside of the ring and just integrate so that they use their ID on the core as their key for accessing all their particular service offerings. So replacing OAuth, for example, or not replacing it, but just putting up a competitor, DOF, right? And that just works, except this one, when you someone says, uh, I wanna sign up with you with my DOF, you get a little pop-up on your screen that says, uh, they want you to disclose this information. Are you okay with that? Knowing that it will only be disclosed to them and they can't share it, that's illegal. So, so and then you move like, down the path. To, to pull this off, it sounds like we have to educate people on the intricacies of public private key encryption and let them know like, hey, even your quote unquote public ID, you know, this ID that's generated uniquely for you is not public. It's completely secret and private. You should never expose it. But the concern I have there, you know, you know, well, I mean, at Mr. FIO, Mr. FIO, yeah. the user will never see it. The user well, will never see it. <laughs> the interesting thing about it is like, we have to, as an, I might've been in this space for seven and a half years. And, and the conclusion I've come to is that crypto is too hard and public private key encryption is too difficult. PGP has been around forever. And most people, everyday people don't use it because it's just too complicated to manage these, these private keys in an, in an effective way. And so we, I kind of was like, well, let's make it easier. And we have this trend with PayPal onboarding Bitcoin and this idea that people are going to be sending and receiving value with a username or an email address or a phone number on WhatsApp or WeChat. Like this is where the world is moving, whether we like it or not. And our, my approach is, well, I, I'd rather they move towards decentralized identity systems, decentralized currencies, decentralized stores of value. And so what we're working on with Theo is this kind of human readable Luke at Stokes very simple and, and that because that's what people right. want and so I, exactly I, <clears throat> technologists and innovators were like pushing what's best for you here's the technology that's going to serve you best here's what you should adopt and implement and the market just chuckles and moves along right so i'm wondering right. how do we tie in this human readable aspect of making the public private key portion simpler these interactions like because when i even when i log in and do an oauth as an example i use my email i don't use my actual oauth code that's generated for me dynamically with that relationship right i use i use something the, I sim the simplest way to start is with a qr code right you want to do an oauth login with a d off uh thing it would just you'd click the d off button i'll put some a barcode you pick up your uh, authentication okay, so device I'm sorry, uh, possibly, and you I'm scan it remember i'm just a lawyer oauth d off i mean i've seen oh, oh. Okay, OAuth is every time you see a button that says log in with Facebook, log in with Google, log in with Microsoft, you're effectively using the OAuth, uh, which stands for open authentication. Uh, and you're using Facebook's credential management system to log into other services in exchange for Facebook and that other service being able to track the fact that you've done that and know something about you from your Facebook profile or your Google profile or your Microsoft profile. Okay, and I, I think right. I've seen different versions of that standard, I think. I think I've seen version one and version two. Is that right? Yeah, there's yep, a, that's true. Of all over time. And in fact, I've, I've worked at implementing it in certain systems, So, but it's like every single time there's that pop-up saying, do you want to log in? And you notice you're in this little window and it's like, it starts to look like Facebook. And it's like, do you want to give Facebook this information? And, and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, well, I don't really want to, but I want access to the service you're about to provide me. So you hit the button and you sell your soul to the centralized, you know, devil and you get access. But it is it is an interesting process where there's this centralized component of 
we are the server that can vouch that you're a real person. And that, that if you trust Facebook and my account with Facebook, then you trust that relationship that now I've created directly with you via Facebook. I mean, literally the codes go back and forth, but ultimately it's my Facebook login. That's my email that I connect to when I'm interacting with that. And QR codes are interesting, but they're not encrypted. They're, they're, I mean, there's a attack be. potential there and stuff like that, right? So you can put anything, you can put anything into a QR code. I'm sure you know that. Yeah. Including an encrypted message that is meant just for you and only your device could decrypt. But Marco, I don't think the problem is technical. I probably you can solve it with QR codes. No, I agree. It's not technical. It's implementation and shipping it. How do you ship it without telegraphing to the planet that when this thing gets used by a lot of different apps and a lot of different infrastructures, that it will become a unified uh, de facto, not de jure, um, infrastructure for identity that is decentralized, is owned by no one, has no token attached to it, is literally designed not to be owned, except collectively by all individuals. Yeah, but no. Once again, like, how do you convince people? Because most of the people I talk to, they don't care. You it's don't. Like you don't. You don't convince people. You implement a solution for people. Let me, let me get through this. You implement a solution for people that they do need. Think Civic. Think uh, Comply Advantage. All of these yeah. types of companies that currently are providing KYC AML checking so that people can get into brokerage accounts, bank accounts. Most, most uh, of the people, they don't know they need it. They, they really, well, they, they do. They, 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 go, they go, they go, they go, oh my God, I want, I want to get into Revolut. I want to get into Revolut. I want a Revolut account because all my friends have Revolut accounts and I've got to have one too. And what does Revolut do? They outsource their KYC AML to a service provider who does it all online. Really cool. Just scan your face, scan your passport, type in some information, send. And sometime in the next uh, 10 minutes to three days, you'll get a verified and off you go. What if on the back end, instead of using some uh, centralized KYC provider, you took that KYC provider and said, you know what, instead of doing it that way, do it this way. It's better long-term for the world, but you're only talking to the techies here. You're not talking to your customer. And as these registrations go on, which they're gonna go on, you can't stop them. We're in a very uh, compliance-oriented world these days. These registrations go on, build up the core. But that sounds like a centralized system building top of a decentralized system, like because then your identity. Uh, except it isn't centralized. You have no control on that identity. Basically, you need to have control. No, no, on that but identity. You... And most of the people. They well, no, you still have control. Revolut still has control because they've set up a relationship with this unique identifier of you, right? They have control over that. They're capable of now sharing that with other parties uh, in the same business model they already had. The idea, though, is that there's, you're, what you're now doing is you're building up this decentralized uh, infrastructure for the core by adding people to it as they go through with their day-to-day -day normal stuff, right, where they're getting online verified by whoever. And you're building it up. And other apps can now come on. Other, again, not, not me. I don't want to do this. I want anybody else out there to use this core as just the way they go through doing their back-end check. Because if there's Revolut has put you onto this system because you went through a Revolut uh, KYC process and you now have a relationship with Revolut, logged into the, basically uh, linked on the system, and you also have a relationship with Revolut's KYC provider because that also got added in. And then one day someone brings out an app and says, here, here's a digital ID. It could be File for all we know. File could come up with their own wallet and say, you know what? We've got this great new identity thing. We're going to KYC you once if you aren't already KYC'd by this back end that we already have. We're not going to tell you all about that. That's very secret, secure stuff. But uh, we have a back end that knows a lot of people already who have been verified. And if you're not on that list, then fine, we can add you. And they bring out a wallet that says, okay, now we're going to let you attach all of your crypto accounts to your ID. And we're going to allow you to create a whole bunch of pseudonyms for your crypto accounts using the FIO protocol. You're still accountably verified. They've done the KYC thing. And technically within FIO's community, they can link all of those pseudonyms to a unique identity. 
but you've now built out a whole crypto infrastructure where if, if someone wants to send from one person to another, they no longer have to worry about addresses. They can now use names, pseudonyms, but names. Much easier for people to get involved in. In addition, Luke? in addition, depending on how you structured it, even that connection to to the FIO protocol and how you do that could be just another relationship. Meaning, I've got a relationship yes. with you. I've got a relationship with Unstoppable Domains. I've got a relationship with you know ENS or whatever. Finance. So one of the yeah. concerns I have with, with some of these things is for this the core idea. The core idea to this, to me, is unique. Mm -hmm ability of an individual human consciousness. Like that's the core concept. You, you know, that that is the core idea that as soon as I can kind of connect with different other relational identity type solutions, I get to duplicate myself to some degree. And this becomes the one standard to rule them all. It almost has to be that because I can have my, you know, we, we haven't even given this a name, you know, let's call it the SSDID, I guess. So the SSDID, I've got my ID there. Well, let's say you I also go my ID with someone else and I get my ID with someone else and I get my ID with someone else. And now I'm five people in a sense, right? And well, then effectively, you, you become a thousand people. Identity. But then you need to have control on your identity. That means having a wallet. That means educating people. And I think it's quite important to educate, but th there's a long road there. Most of the people I talk to, they don't care about privacy. They say, no, I'm not doing anything wrong. So I don't care about privacy. I'm, they, are, they are really wrong about that. But we need to educate on, on identity and privacy and, and tell them it's, it's, you need to protect yourself. You need to change your mind when it comes to, to the way you relate on internet. And, and, and that's a long journey. That's what, what I was saying. Oh, like that's they, a journey, no yeah, argument. You, you're not gonna get people to jump, well, not, well, you'll get a lot of people to jump on just for the privacy function. But a lot of people, as you say, they don't care. <laughs> that's, you know, that's just life. They do care when they're told they're being surveilled. That's a whole think, different story. Surveillance think, scares people, upsets them, right? I think it goes both ways as well, though. And I've taken a controversial stance in this space in that I'm always Luke Stokes everywhere. I'm very public about it, you know? And some people say, oh my gosh, well, how can you do that? You should not be public and be in the blockchain space. And my response is, you Google my name, I get to control the output for the last 10 plus years because I've been blogging on a blockchain on Hive, you know, previously Steam, you know, it's immutable, my thoughts at that moment. And no one else can control a narrative about who Luke Stokes is other than me, because I've been blogging on a platform where I control the content for over four years now. So I, I feel like there's two sides to this identity and privacy coin in that I want to be able to be publicly controlling in a way that connects all my different things saying, oh, you're the same guy that worked over there. You worked with the OSDAC, you worked with Theo, you worked with this company called Foxy Cart. Like these relationships I've had of what I've done in the world, it's the combination of those in the real world that commits my relational connection with another human being where they go, ah, I trust Luke. He's actually done some things in the world I can verify. It's only when I, that information combines together, like we talked about earlier, those sticks all bound together that someone has a, 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 an image of me in their mind that they can interact with effectively. And so when I think about this, I think that, you know, these individual relationships that can't talk to each other cryptographically, they're completely separate. Someone's inevitably gonna bring them together because that's, a, that's how we interact as humans. No, but you control whether or not they come together. That's the key point here. You don't allow, if you have these, as you said, they're disparate. No one can know by having a relationship on Facebook does not give Facebook any ability, cryptographically speaking, to find out whether you have a relationship with Google. There's no way for them to do that. Okay. But if Facebook says, I'd like you to disclose your relationship with, with Google and you say, okay, then that's on you. Right. <laughs> because, yes, you, you could create these things. And as you mentioned before, this thousands of um, relationships that you have, all of them contribute what you might want to call relationship specific disclosures to your overarching identity that you are the only person who can see the whole thing. But someone comes to you and I'm going to take the Chinese government standard, right? You're a non-Chinese citizen. Or, or, and you have no relationship with China, but you decide to go to China, right? And when you get there and you've got your, uh, the self sovereigns, uh, I call it the Kevlar project, the idea of being bulletproof ID. Um, 
but uh, the, Kev, the if you walk in with your Kevlar wallet and they and then and it's accepted as a border control device, and and they say, okay, in order for us to give you your two week tourist visa, we want you to disclose this, and the list is all your financial transactions, two weeks before and up to four weeks after you leave, whether they're in country or not, we don't care, <laughs> right? All your commercial transactions. We want all the name, uh, your, your personal data, where you live, where you're going to be staying, all that other stuff. Uh, and we want you to put on GPS tracking so that we can track you wherever you go for the duration of your visa stay. And you look at that as you're sitting there at the airport and you go, uh, <laughs> right? But they could ask that. And there's no reason they shouldn't ask it if that's what they want to do. And this is when it comes back to the whole concept of while individuals are completely private, groups are have to disclose publicly what their disclosure requirements are at a minimum and who their owners slash uh, persons of significant control are uh, so that people can before interacting with a relationship can look at it and go oh yeah i'm not going to china i just saw their visa requirements they basically want to know everything about me and they're going to store it locally yeah no right uh i don't want to do that and that's fine. That, you know, and the other option, the other extreme is I go to a bank in a country that's very enlightened and they decide that they've connected with this infrastructure and they recognize the fact that it is less assailable than any other identification protocol out there. I mean, everything's assailable. If it's made by man, it can be broken by man. That's one of my little philosophies. <laughs> uh, but it's the least assailable solution out there for identification. And the bank can simply go in and say, uh, you walk into the bank and say, I want to open an account with you. And all they're going to say is, I want your identity to confirm in a binary answer that you meet these criteria. And the criteria would be, do you live in the country, uh, if that's a requirement? Uh, are you old enough to open a bank account? And do you have any black marks in your financial history? All right? And if your collective identity says no, None of those apply to this guy, or rather, he, this guy's good to go for you. They get a binary answer back, forms a relationship with you, and you're accountable, right? So you can't, and there's no way for you to lie about this because all the data that's coming in, uh, or rather being checked, was securely created with other relationships you set up. So, so you can't an lie. Example, an example that, that I've heard talked about is like a carbon credit is not a carbon credit is not a carbon credit. Meaning you get a carbon credit from Germany, it's different than a carbon credit from some backwards country that's like, yeah, whatever, we just, you know, rubber stamped it because the, you know, bureaucrat got paid, you know, five bucks under the table. So the idea that right. we'd have to expose, basically, if I'm understanding the model, we'd have to expose some level of threshold of validity to these other validations. The bank wants to know it wasn't your brother, Jim Bob Joe, that says you're, you know, that you live here. It's actually some reputable no. entity that I can validate cryptographically, right? Well, that's again, back to your relationships, right? You as an entity will have a relationship with yourself. This was some, one of the little key tweaks I had, to, uh, I had to figure out. And every entity has a relationship with itself. That relationship with yourself is where all your analytics show. So have you, what, what is the quality of your verification of your name, your birth date, your uh, place of residence? And it's all based on the other relationships you have and the, and the quality of those relationships with respect to authority. For example, if you're talking about your name, birth date, and, uh, and uh, place of birth, for example, uh, you would say, okay, well, who verified that? And maybe it's, you know, Comply Advantage KYC provider, or it's your government verified it. Um, so the governments, you know, if you're to say an American government, then you probably get a really high rating on the quality of that particular piece of data. And that would go into your self relationship as the quality of the name attribute of this person is 90%. Or 98%, or whatever the case may be. And you can, and all of that is done analytically based on the ongoing ratings of every uh, entity out there. So, as adoption accrues and what you would call disputes are started to, you know, uh, start to get uh, 
show up in the system saying, no, no, that guy's not a real person. And the U.S. government said he was a real person. So the U.S. government's rating just went down a tick uh, because they authorized somebody who wasn't real. Uh, when you get down to, to, to that level, then and those relationships, it's all off chain, really. Uh, it's all analytics feeding into it. Right. So it's off chain. It doesn't consume any of your, uh, you know, precious resources in a in the world, but it is analytically provable that these things are real. So I'd love to hear Alex's thought on that. But the last comment that I'm still trying to wrap my head around is I then have to expose you started giving examples like Vant of KYC or whatever I, I US government, I then have to choose to expose those relationships with others as it relates to me and the relational identity I'm connecting with some other entity. And so that self relationship with myself, you don't. Is it is that piece something that I can't write to without other people writing to as well? So I can't just like can lie about it, basically. So that self exactly is where, you know, the government or whatever, they, they choose to write to that relationship in a way that no, others no, no, I, I'm still, the self relationship is analytics said. only. What's that? It's analytics only. It's analytics only. It looks at all your relationships. Right. And it grabs the ratings or the strength or the quality ratings or whatever it is where we, you know, I haven't gone down the rabbit hole yet on, on all those, but it, I know it's doable, but it's an analytics rating on each of your relationships as, a, as it relates to the various disclosures that are currently available to you. And it gives an overall ranking of those based on the relationships you've formed. So when you form a relationship with Comply Advantage, sure, Comply Advantage gets all your passport information and all that stuff in order to verify you, but it's locked, right? They can't expose it unless a court order shows up and they're forced to. Um, otherwise it's locked and tight, but Comply Advantage is doing that for thousands of people. And the number of uh, <clears throat> fraud or fake ID uh, cases that get filed against them tells you how uh, versus the number they actually process tells you how good they are, right? But that's an analytics thing. That's off chain. But your your personal ID can now go and point to, well, I got my ID verified by Comply Advantage, and their current ranking is blah 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 blah, right? And they, you can disclose without you, you don't get to actually type this in, right? This is all being done automatically in the back end. You get to disclose to a, another relationship, potential relationship, that your identity was verified by a verifier that has a ranking of blank currently. And that, even if that changes over time, it would always be the current ranking, right? So you get a, a really good. Um, dynamic system, right? Some, some KYC providers will be really high at the beginning and then they'll tail off over time. Governments will come in and you'll say, wait a minute, that Zimbabwean verification you got? <laughs> Sorry, buddy. <laughs> but they just plummeted below 50%. We're not trusting that. <laughs> Honestly, uh, Alex? Yeah, I've been listening to you on uh, um... I see many things here. One of these, like if you want to, to provide uh, really privacy, probably then you will miss accountability. Like for example, I, I'm not sure if you know, uh, I'm not, I don't mean you Mark, uh, people that they are listening, they know about uh, zero knowledge proof or uh, homomorphic encryption. There are ways to create uh, full privacy without disclaiming any, any kind of information. First thing is like, I, I don't believe we should have a number. I'm not a number. so. Uh, my identity, probably, there's a lot of, of uh, private keys, public keys, but not a, a DID. I think DIDs are for public organizations, maybe cars, but not for people. That's one, one thing. And then if I I'm want gonna to- I'm going to stop you right there, Alex. Just before you before you go any further, you are a number. Uh, you just don't not. recognize the fact I, that you're I, a number. No, no. The, the fact that well, I am- Which number is he? He am many numbers. Alex Puig. Uh, living in Barcelona, uh, which if you're speaking to somebody who say <laughs> has only has been a Bushman all his life and doesn't speak any other language, you might as well be speaking in numbers. It's a I, linguistic I, convention that your name is not a number. It is a number as much as a, a number is a number. Does I, that make I, sense? I work, with, I work with a few Chinese people and they love it because like uh, my number, the number of my name, it means success, something like that. So they love working with me. <laughs> Just because of the number, <laughs> but but I mean, like 
uh, the way we, we approach uh, uh, relations, like we use Zillow proof. And what we do is like, if, if I get verified, like I do my QYC, instead of having a credential proving my QYC, something signed by someone else saying that it's me, we create a, a, a generator of proof. So basically the, the issuer gives me a generator of proof I can use every time I get a new relation. Meaning that my identity is really completely different for everyone. And even I'm using the, the same QYC, two or three different people, they could not see that they are, they are talking also to me. So the, that's exactly what I was saying. All of these relations, the relationship cannot, IDs, yeah, right. But, then, but the relationship ID is exactly that. It takes there, there's it's a mathematical function. Doesn't need uh, zero knowledge, thank God, uh, because that's a bit of a load on the client side. Uh, but no, right now, bearing in mind, remember, there's no servers a, in the core. There's a, None. There's a, a library you can use. It's called Zendru. Quite useful. Yeah, and yeah. Then they have yeah. Proof integrated and you and it works pretty well on the on the client side but, but any, any, when i was so, when i was showing there that that re unique rid hmm. that i mentioned in the in the model that with the, every relationship has a unique rid it's globally unique yeah yeah but, and but it's basically me, based on no the ID. public keys of the of the two parties but marco there, there's no there's no id like uh zero knowledge proof it's it just a proof it's like somebody else uh, verify my identity and I'm just saying like, uh, yes, this is me. I can do this. Like I live in Barcelona or uh, I'm a member of some community or I work at, at, at a company. All of these relations, they could become you know, it's proof. Meaning that uh, there's no ID at all. It's just because like every time I, I, I'm just proving anything. Like a uh, real privacy, real anonymity. It's not that if I talk to you and then I talk to someone else, both of oh. you can me. It means that if I talk to you and I talk to you again, you cannot, say, you cannot say that it's me again. That's real privacy. Okay, and that's why, that's why we do it this way. We don't do the zero knowledge thing in that respect because the, if you talk to somebody once and you set up a relationship, every talk, every discussion you have with them afterwards must be knowable as you. That's where accountability comes in. And if you don't have accountability, if you, if you don't have accountability in the system, no one will use it. It's much like uh, we've been having this battle about uh, how you set up a DAO in the world, right? When DAOs are supposed to be jurisdictionless, autonomous uh, organizations. And the, 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 the real problem with that is, is that if you are jurisdictionless, uh, then you have no legal foundation. If you have no legal foundation, I have no reason to trust you. I'm not going to send you money. I'm not going to expect you to send me money uh, because there's just no way for me to legally even believe that that would be possible. Accountability is a thing that normally is handled in our world by me presenting you with a, with a driver's license and a utility bill and you feeling comfortable that, okay, I know who he is, at least the government says that's who he is, and I know where he lives, at least the utility company says that's where he lives, so I'm reasonably safe, I feel safe that I can call the police and send them to his place and they will be able to arrest him if he screws me over. I'm moving, trying to move beyond that and say, no. I don't want to have to give you all of that. I just want to be able to give you a unique relationship ID between me and you that says, while this relationship exists, you can always reach out and touch me if I've done bad things. And I can always reach out and touch you if you've done bad things. But there's no reason for me to share with you stuff that you could cross match with anybody else. Yeah, but, but one of the things like, not all relations are the same and should have the same privacy level. Meaning if we are companies and I want to pay for something, then obviously I want to an accountability. But if not, like there are many situations right now, physically and digitally that I don't need that accountability and probably I don't want it. Even like- uh, Name one. Guys, let, let, let me jump in one second. I, I don't want to, sure. want to continue this conversation, but we're getting a ton of good questions in the chat. And Marco, at, at your convenience and, dis and discretion, I would, I'd like to engage some of these people also and get, get them off mute and have the free for all. So, oh, uh, yeah, let's go. Let's go to town. <laughs> okay, so I, I got my buddy Jan Kyle. Uh, Jan, you're asking go ahead. You know, of course, we got well, we got a whole bunch of good people, but I'm just gonna I'm gonna start with Jan. Jan, by the way, is primarily living in Ukraine. I've been to his dacha. I've had chef's leak with him. Which is sort of Russian Ukrainian barbecue, but he's a German expatriate. So go put that all together. Jan, introduce yourself and, and then you know, maybe 
ask that question. Yeah. I but miss well, Banya. Good morning or good evening. I good so morning. miss Banya. Yeah. Marco, next time, next time Corona is, is behind us and you are able to fly to Ukraine without having a residential status, please, my door is very well open. Uh, very well open. Yeah. I, well, I currently can't leave. I'm in the same boat. They closed the airport. <laughs> Um, I don't know how much important it is to introduce myself. I'm just a random guy, a little bit connected to blockchain um, since 2015. I'm working for an Ukrainian outsourcing company. We are supporting startups, but also, uh, let's say, so the old economy, the old industries, optimizing their business processes. So for me, it is very important to understand, actually, and discuss. Not, not. I mean, you, you, you discussed a lot, lot of technical aspects over the last period, and then decided whether we are a number or not. Let's let's keep that as a as a let's keep it as it is. Okay, there is technology involved, and maybe yes, technology should not be on the forefront um, because, like my grandma is, is using the internet and she don't know ADP or JavaScript about. So let's 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 keep it there. I believe that if we speak about self surveying identities, we also have to think about the business models and the business cases that need to change. At the moment, uh, we see that trust and data is locked down in silos, whether in America as the guiding nation with all their Facebooks and Google and Amazon and whatsoever, then the Asians coming in with Alibaba and then a little tiny percentage, we have the European, European uh, digital providers. So if you speak about a self-surveying identity and most likely about a self-surveying identity which is built on top of blockchain, I mean, we know self-surveying identity can, build, can be built again without blockchain, but if we put it on blockchain and if we decentralize it, then we, have, then we, are, then, then we are thinking about the rules, right? We are changing the rules of business. We are fucking with the revenue stream. Sorry for my French. That, and, French? Um, that is my mission in life, to fuck with the system. Where's James Haft when you need him? <laughs> so, so I would I would like to 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 first of all also understand because I, I haven't I haven't eaten all the all the knowledge with a golden spoon so I'm 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 I, I also don't have the silver bullet but so that's why I would like to learn but also then listening to you maybe contribute so what is the business model that needs to change yeah it's no longer the user who is to be seen as a product because the user then will keep their data and we mentioned that zero knowledge proofs will help us to share information. So all these business models will need to change. Yes, exactly. And what's your what's your vision? What's your idea? How we can do this on board? I mean, those in power, and I'm not kind of Illuminati or something like that, but those in power, they, they don't want to give it away. That's that's clear. Well, and this was the one of the key points, right? Is that uh, whether or not you like the idea of being assigned a number, um, the the reason that the that we have all this data going around about ourselves is because we have to prove we're accountable right we have to prove we're accountable to a certain degree to facebook we have to prove we're accountable to google uh, that often that involves putting down a credit card for example uh, which is another form of identity um, you have to prove to your bank that you exist in the jurisdiction that they're allowed to serve so you have to do all this anyway, but if you could build it into an infrastructure where nobody owned it and nobody controlled it other than the collective, all people controlled it uh, through a very high level uh, governance process, and you, you've, you've got it fully decentralized, then people connecting will simply choose to use that as their method of connecting versus another tool. and the disclosure pieces, which is what we're really concerned about here, right? It's, it's what are you disclosing and what can they do with the stuff you've disclosed? And there will be a race to the bottom once this kind of thing gets going in terms of service providers, businesses, if you will, saying, well, I require you to give me all of this. And it could be, you know, everything that's on your passport, everything that's on your utility bill and, you know, your last five uh, jobs and uh, what your performance re report re reviews were and everything else, all that other stuff that might may or may not be already set up within your identity. And there'll be another guy who comes along and says, I'll give you the exact same service, but all I want is your name. In fact, it can be a pseudonym if you like. And then I want proof that these things exist in your identity. 
Okay. which is basically just a, your identity says yes, no. Now you're right. It's going to completely upend a lot of business models because a lot of business models are based on the idea that they can reach out and touch you outside the context of their business. Mm -hmm. This would eliminate that ability. You would not be able to reach out and touch this person outside the context of that, of your initial relationship. Let me, let me pause this one sec. The I think, Sergey, I wanted to bring you in and I think you have a related question or an independent question that, that we're going to throw into the mix here. Yes, finally, words goes to my side also. Yes, we have huge community watching us on the TV channel. And but the question is not mine. The question is from Aaron. He will not able to join us and he eager to know how to apply this concept to the airline industry in manner to protect mm -hmm. personal data. What's your alternative to common pass, for example, please, Marco? Uh, well, it's it literally, if you think about it, what is the common pass? It's a form of verification that you've gone through that says that your passport is real, that your residence is real, uh, and all these kinds of things. And they just packaged it as a relationship between you and common pass. And the airport, airline industry has said, if you've got a common pass, we're okay with you flying. And if in this model, your relationship with common pass would be one relationship. Okay. And then your relationship with the airline would require you to disclose, do you have a common pass? Yes, no. And you don't get to answer the question. When I keep, I keep saying that, you know, you have, do you have one? It's not about whether or not you say you have one. It's, is there a record in your, in your local self-sovereign identity database that says common pass has passed you? And if that record exists, send a yes back to the airline. And you would probably do that when you bought the ticket. But the main thing, uh, it's that probably SSI is the closest thing to the non-digital world. In, in, in the past, like when you bought something, it was printed and then you have it and you own it and then you just go there and you decide to uh, disclose who you are and, and you decide to show the, 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 the board pass and then you get in and then everything changed a lot and maybe we can go back to that. Something that's really close to the physical world, but it's just another relation as, as, as Marco said. Uh, answering also the, the other question, I do, I do believe that digit identity, I, I'm not saying digital, identity should have no business model because basically it's, it's ours. It's like, it's like paying for the year and no, it's something you, you should not pay for. But then you can build a lot of different services on top of that, that will add a lot of value. And probably the services will add UX, you, you will add recovery, will add a lot of things that we need to have this kind of identity and so it can work. But then it's like, if you have this, uh, you have control on your identity and your relationships, uh, an airline is just another relation. It's not, no, no, it's simple. And then you have standards. The good thing is like, you can work with the standards and all, all of the, all of the board passing the world would become exactly the same. So I can use that, not just for that, but also to, to go to, to buy to the, the marketplace to everywhere else. So, um, yeah. yes, you know, I, yeah. I, I mean, think about it. It's almost like if your your one pass or your common pass card and your passport and your driver's license were all white with a picture of you on them and the word driver's license or passport or uh, everything else is white. If you've got the card and the picture matches, you're good to go. <laughs> That's something we should talk about, uh, biometry, like face recognition, something I'm really afraid of. Yes, yes, I, I completely agree with Alex, but we have to have some kind of opportunity to share our, I don't know, biometric information or something else without sharing it in original. Do we have any chances to do it, for example, to, to passing through the airlines? We're talking about that case. We're not talking about how to identify ourselves on the point, yes, on the point of the view. We're talking about identify ourselves without sharing all, all that stuff about us. Uh, that, that can be done uh, also like zero knowledge proof. There are many technologies that allows us to do that. But then um, I think it's quite important. Like uh, when it comes to biometry, big problem is like uh, you, you get uh, to work with silos of information and, and like the airport, they need to store all of the faces of, of everyone. And if anybody steals that information, that's really a big leap. So 
It's a lot of sensible information that nobody should have. It's only me. Or maybe we could have like a service. Imagine a service that they become our biometric provider because we trust them. Okay. And we then they we have- talked about the KYC. Yeah. Remember, Alex, no, we were no, talking no, about the KYC. Exactly. They, they take a selfie, right? No, they no, require you to send them a selfie. So you can now, like that, that selfie is now a disclosure, disclosure data that you can share on demand at any point at the airline or wherever. You can share the selfie that was verified by a KYC provider. Yeah, and but then but the people look at that, look at you, good to go. No, but there's a better way. Um, even so, um, they can do it automatically, meaning that you have relations. Why not use these relations? If I have two, two relations, one with the airport and one with uh, my biometric provider, the airport can take a picture sign this picture digitally, send it to me. I send it to the, to the airport, I, to the, the biometric provider that's recognized by the airport. And then they give me back that picture made by the airport, signed by them. So even I'm in the middle, there's no, no way I can change these signatures from the different providers, not the airport, not the provider. And the airport, they don't need to have my identity or the bank or wherever I go, they don't need to have my biometric information I just need to trust a, a well-known uh, uh, biometric provider. So we can solve that and nobody needs to yeah, know that's a, that's a, a picture of my face. That's a, yeah, that's a real world, like on the spot, certified. In other words, you've taken the human out of that picture, right? Yep. No human is required to verify your face. Okay. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I suspect that the real world scenarios will likely be, uh, uh, some of them will go that route, no argument. And maybe down the road, all of them will go that route. But I think for initial, when we start this thing, that, that little selfie you had to take to get your KYC verification, which is now a disclosable factor within your self-sovereign ID, you can expose it for 10 seconds. Right. You can say, expose this to this this uh, potential relationship I'm going to have. Expose this for 10 seconds to them. And their app literally pops up the picture of you for 10 seconds and they get to look at it, look at you, look at it, look at you and go, oh, yeah, check. I'm good with that. This is who they say they are. Before we get to uh, Gabby, I just want to make another comment on the business model part that relates to kind of what you just said. You, you earlier said it's going to be a race to the bottom where people are going to you know, care about their privacy and be like, oh, well, I won't work with this because they're asking for too much information. But I want to propose the, con- the concern I have that it'll go the opposite direction, meaning, well, now that I only accept your global ID and there's no other form of authentication that I like, and you really like my service and you really aren't smart enough to care about privacy, I'm going to ask for everything from the kitchen sink because I can no longer go get it from the advertising network where previously, if I just had your email, I could know everything about you. If I just had your IP address and your, your, your cookies on your browser, I can know everything about you. Now that I can't, I have to be like a Hoover vacuum and suck up as much information as I can for my own database because I know I can't get it anywhere else and I can't correlate it with anything else. So I'm concerned that it's going to actually lead to the opposite because people want the service and they don't value their own data as they should. Let me pause. Would you stand for that, Luke? Pause for one second. Gabby may I'm saying to- my opinion is irrelevant. It's what the market's going to do that matters. Not when a lot of people like you out there screaming bloody murder. Oh, oh, hell no. Oh, hell no. <laughs> right? Again, I'm the guy that's been completely public for 10 plus years on my identity, right? I'm not the example of privacy because I, I want to control my conversation about the thing that we consider Luke Stokes. All right, guys, let me jump in one second. Guillaume, if I'm saying your name correctly, Guillaume Graybon. Yeah. Hey, uh, if you're comfortable with it, uh, turn on the video just like so you can see your smiling face. Or if you're if you're if you're mourning inappropriate, it's okay too. We'll just go no, it's fine. <laughs> hey, Hello. Nice background. Guillaume. Ça va? Ça roule. Très bien, oui. But, uh, please go ahead. You're just yeah, yeah, okay. question. Yeah, I have a question because I see um, uh, some danger in this kind of um, of system. Uh, is is the case where you are forced to to, to reveal some, some information? In that case, you, you cannot you cannot cheat. You cannot uh, try to um, um, give wrong information because then everything is uh, is uh, cryptographically uh, um, can be checked. Proven. So, uh, like yeah, yeah. I, 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 for instance, you, you gave the the example of China. Okay, I won't. Uh, okay, I decide not to go there. Good. But now, let's say you are somewhere else, and then uh, the police, uh, because you 
they, they ask you to, to give the information, and if you don't give it, you go to, to prison, for instance. And in that case, okay, uh, maybe sometimes you, are, you will be forced to reveal the information, and then there is no way you can cheat. You see what I mean? You, you, I, you... I, love, I love that question. In fact, yeah. I, I was in a, a conference in, uh, in Brussels, I think it was, and we spent a, around half an hour debating on my right to lie to people. <laughs> so... <laughs> Right. Well, this is one of the downsides of a trustable digital identity is that in order for the identity, the things you build around your digital identity, in order for them to be trustable, and if they're not trustable, what's the freaking point? Why are we even bothering? But in order to make them trustable, lying has to be impossible. Yeah, but the lying problem is, is that which, all, all which is uncomfortable. Data. I get it. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's you, you, you <clears throat> the problem is that when you are forced to, to disclose some data, uh, sometimes you can you, you can lie by uh, omission, like by not uh, telling. You maybe you don't lie, but you just don't answer. But in that case, they they can have access to all your information. Like they say, okay, give us your uh, private key, else you go to, to to prison for 10 years. Okay, I will give my private key then. And then they will have access like, to everything. Yeah. Governments are less democratic every time. So probably they will ask us like, uh, what's your religion? Or what, what's your social orientation? I, I want to be able to lie about that. Yeah. Probably there, yeah. of course I cannot lie about taxes. I know that. But if I want to lie about my sexual life, why not? Yeah. Exactly. But for instance, uh, I think it's a good analogy when you install an, an app on a, on your Android phone. That it asks you, hey, this app requires this authorization and this this permission and so on and so on. So you can refuse. But what what I would like to do, like for instance, some apps they ask you for your GPS position and they clearly they don't need it. So why cannot say, okay, I will give you a fake GPS position? Why not? This kind of stuff. Okay. You know, now now you're talking about a. Uh... Um, and, and here's the real problem. Right? What you're getting to is that you want to lie or rather you want to lie by omission, right? And when you do disclosures and things like that, that is the, ca that is the case. In a situation where a government official asks you to disclose, and this is part of what's going to have to happen over time, there will be cases, especially for the first, and my guess is 25 years that this is used, where there will be people who overstep. Tell me your private key, right? Well, ideally, you don't know your private key because the system has been built decently enough that you don't actually ever have to interact with your private key. But if they say, I need you to disclose all your relationships, everything, to us, that's on record. Okay, that's the first thing that is, uh, is, is, is a policing function of the, of the design here is that when someone says, you, I need you to disclose everything, and they are not an individual, they are a group, right? They're, they're the police force, they're the government, whatever it is. Uh, and they say, disclose everything. That is recorded. That's on chain. That is publicly viewable. The fact, not, not the data, but the fact that a full disclosure was, was, was demanded by uh, group X. That will get the activists involved if for no other reason, then that's, that's heinous and uh, it should not be allowed and whatever. Eventually, UN is going to come up with the uh, thou shalt not uh, kind of concept that, you know, no one's allowed to rape you of your personal data, uh, whether they're a government or not. Uh, but until we get there, yes, these are going to happen and there's not much you can do about it. But the point that I'm, I guess I'm trying to make is, is that the person who did it, the uh, auspices under which they were doing it, the group they represented, uh, that's all on record publicly that they did it. So the system itself question. would have... Uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, sorry. I, I was gonna think, I think you answered my question about the defense mechanism against the hoovering up of data. And it's a compelling argument, I like it. One of the things that I guess I wanna see next is an entire presentation on this kind of self-referential relationship that has all my analytics and how that's actually done in a decentralized way. Because I think that is the magic sauce to this whole thing. If you can do that, you build a trust network, you build a reputation system, you bet, you know, like we get back, uh, Wolf was on the call earlier and he's always hammering and hammering and hammering away how it's reputation, it's reputation, it's reputation. And so you're essentially describing this reputation thing where it's like, oh yeah, you'll be able to know 
if an entity hoovered up your data, but it's like, I don't understand how, because that relationship idea is a unique global identifier and it's not connected to me until I disclose it and say, hey, everybody, this group here tried to screw me over and take all my data. You know, how is that actually known? Well, actually, by the, relationship, the relationship idea is public. But the, the relationship, relationship idea, idea is public. You're a conscious person, right? It's like, I have to be the one no. to complain to the, you know, the privacy advocates. Yes. And then one of the, uh, one of the sort of the core uh, sort of tenets of this would be determining from analytics, right? When you made a disclosure that was unreasonable, right? So you decided to disclose to somebody everything or significant components of things. And especially when that is happening to a group or an individual that represents a government or a corporation, uh, those kinds of things would be inbuilt red flags that would stand up. And then the people who, who are you're related that. to, I've only ever the seen people you're related to, way, right? Like when you say it gets well, flagged, it, it is it's centralized in your app. Centralized model I've ever it's been. There's some custodians or there's some, <laughs> there's some moderators, or, you know, there's some human conscious interaction to say, oh, that was bad, but that was okay, right? They're, they're making, we're making a moral claim almost about whether something was uh, obscene or not. And, and, and that is the part that I, I'm still like, how do we do that in a decentralized way? That, that's, that's, that's third party centralized analytics. That's centralized in the sense that activist groups will form their own analytics engine that watches watches the infrastructures and says, oh, that doesn't look good. And wait a minute, 1,000 uh, uh, identity tracking requests were issued by the NSA last uh, five minutes ago. 1,000? For what? Uh, those kinds of things. That would be uh, something that a third-party activist group would do and probably would publish uh, so, so on a website of some kind. Would that to work sure, then? Sure that it would just be AI tracking anomalies. On. Everyone, everyone pause. I want to thank yeah. our esteemed leader in other contexts, Timothy Lewis, for jumping on board. Tim, just a sentence about yourself and then go. I'm uh, just uh, trying to be a decent human being. Um, so, um, yeah, I think, I, think, I think ultimately you'd have AI that would just track and pick up anomalies for record tracking. Uh, you know, and I think that that would just probably be built in on you know, decentralized systems. Uh, and then or not it doesn't really matter yeah and then 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 we would just do you probably just have more uh visibility to um people who were doing uh things that were outside of the characteristic norms of things and whether or not people would go and check in on people if uh something strange was happening uh, i think that'd be up to the communities um but yeah no it's it, it you know, sounds interesting. Would you not be able to do some sort of false flag um, for, you know, again, if, if the, 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 what I was thinking about for if someone was requesting uh, access to your um, bucket of information, uh, not, assuming they wouldn't be able to point out, hey, this is your key, this is your, this is your, uh, we, we, you have the key to this account. Um, would you not be able to be, be, be supplied with some other, you know, basically kind of blank, uh, blank slate to, to, Bala, to Bala Rasa uh, type of uh, identification that could uh, really just give them uh, nothing but verifies everything you have? Well, yeah, well, that's the, the, the goal is to get to the point where the platform is trusted enough that they don't need to see the data. They just need to know that the platform authenticates that the data exists. Sure, it, it, but in Alex's point, um, the baseball bat to the head problem always exists. Right. So, you, you know, you have to be able to defend for that. You know, the, the, the defense I like on my ledger is I give you a different pin and you're looking at accounts you don't that, that have nothing in them. Right. And I, I'd imagine you could build out a similar type system to where, um, you know, I just have to prove that you know, minimums. You know, I have one account that basically has my bio, you know, biological information, my my some of my details you know, that are this bare minimum, that if someone says, hey, you need to identify yourself, I say, this is me. And they could do nothing else to, uh, to, to prove otherwise. Just oh, yes, if sort of yes, yes and no in that respect. I mean, if someone's asking you to identify yourself for, for some reason, uh, I don't see why they need to know how many crypto accounts you have and what their balances are. I don't think you would ever disclose crooked that in your right mind. Crooked governments are crooked governments, right? So people- Oh, agree. 
if they, if they know you have an account with everything that's, that's linked to it, they will ask you for everything um, because they mm -hmm. will. And, um, you know, if, if you needed to come up with an identity to, to say that, to where they couldn't, uh, that, that there, there would be no way to tie someone to any of the, the physical blobs on the network that existed, uh, you could uh, have a false flag identity. You, you could have something else that, uh, that, that, I, that would have your bare minimum identification uh, or some degree of it, um, you know, maybe may looking at that as have, being able to maintain uh, that know, would be full doable. Yeah. yeah, that would be doable. Uh, that would actually so, be a service that some some very smart people would set up on this platform as 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 a as a, as a basically as a service that creates a, a a a cleansed and reasonably benign profile that you can share with people if you don't want to disclose all the truth. The problem is is that it's going to be a basically like viruses, right? Guy writes a virus. Someone writes a virus uh, cure for it. Guy makes a better virus. Virus company makes a better cure, and it's just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, it's 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 back to that whole thing. There's nothing humans can build that humans can't break. <laughs> Which is the 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 philosophical real pain in the ass about this whole thing. Well, actually, I don't I don't know if that's true. The I mean, kind of the premise behind. Ethereum and all these blockchains, and maybe even AI, is that we can create something that's beyond us. The act of creating something is not necessarily the act of breaking it. Um, especially when you get it. No, no, no. I, I wasn't saying that it was the act of. I, I was, I was saying that if we built it, we can find a way to break it. But uh, again, I, I'm not saying that's necessarily true. It's, it's like when you get in a, new, like it's like you know, once the nuclear genie gets out of the bottle it's kind of hard to put it back in. There, there's some things you put out there that take on a life of their own and get beyond our control. It, it depends on your definition of break, but I, I think, I think there's, again, you know, when, when things acquire their own dynamics, the fact that we initially launched them doesn't make them eternally under our control. I would Thanks, say Luke. that the only example I can think of that actually applies to that would be AI. If we actually build a self-learning AI, oh. then that one get away. <laughs> I mean, that's like the only exception is the thing that's going to change our entire planet right now. Okay, <laughs> fine. I, I can see that the main revolution that's happening right now is the exception, but I'll even go beyond there. I mean, the the the, pr the premise of Ethereum and, and Bitcoin and its followers is, you know, if, 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 if Satoshi showed up, I don't think he can go. I gotta change my mind. Pull the plug. It's, you know, or if you design a virus uh, and release it, it's like, you know, I changed my mind. Hey, bye, hey, bye, right, come back. You know, the, a lot of these dynamic, I, I think, and this, this, like most technology, cuts both ways. You can set up beneficial systems so that, the, if, you know, to, to use Tim's, I like that expression, right? Baseball to the head, you know, error, flaw, whatever you said, that, that was good. Um, you, you can set up systems that are, are beyond you, and maybe that's a good thing. You know, and, and lot, lots of science fiction, you know, actually the matrix is about, I'm gonna send myself a mission and then forget that I sent myself a mission or total recall. That's not too far away, right? I'm gonna use myself as a pawn piece in the chess game I've set up. So I, th I think identity could potentially go down that route as well. Yeah. I mean, these are all tools, yeah. you know, you can, you can build a house with a brick or you can break a window. And these are all technology tools, but throughout history, there's been an interesting conversation about how the, instigators of a certain technology are held accountable to what they created. You know, when you think of Oppenheimer, what's the first thing that comes to mind, right? It's the technology invented, you know? And so, and, and the, the crazy thing about that is even the guy who built the mustard gas that killed so many people is kind of a horrible human being also invented nitrogen-based fertilizers, which, you know, provided food for, for millions and billions of people. So I, I think as technologists who are, I think these conversations are important for one, I, I, I've tried to engage certain people that are like, no, I don't want to have that conversation. It's evil. It's bad. You're going to harm a whole bunch of millions of people because IBM provided the machines that enabled the, you know, enabled them to do the Holocaust. You know, I've heard that argument, and so I'm like, okay, but at the same time, I feel like it's inevitably happening. If we don't do it to ourselves, I almost guarantee you AI is going to do it because we're these fleshy meat bags, and they're going to want to have a way to, you know, itemize us as data points, right? So it's going to happen, and and the idea being. 
let's do it with some foresight of like, okay, historically, what has gone bad for our species based on our own fallacies and our own problems and our own, you know, psychosis and whatever. And let's try to build that into the system enough so that there's a bit of protection. So one of the things that I'm concerned about with the primarily with the model Marco is that there's no recovery that I can see when I lose my password, when I lose my private key, when I somehow get disconnected from this, what's the process for recreating myself? Because if you inject that process into the system, you've now broken it. You've now created a mechanism to defraud the system, right? If I can't hit reset, you know, you've also got a problem where, you know, somebody was a bad person, but they've actually reformed. How long will it take them to rebuild their identity? Can they pull a reset and start from zero? And Marco, before no. we that, let, let me say in alignment with that, you know, and again, coming from a warrior perspective, and I'm coming from a perspective of someone who used to do estate planning, when people lose capacity, they get seen out, they end up in a hospital, you have to do power of returning. There's not situations where they're always dead and there's clear instructions about what to do. And I think you guys, there's going to be situations where you have to assume someone else's identity. That's kind of like doing the power of returning. And the, yeah, that's equivalent of forgetting, but, but not, not sloppy or lazy forgetting. But life happened forgetting. So how do you, how do you roll with that? Okay, so uh, we've thought quite a bit about that. And I'm not going to get into the technical details. But there are at least seven paths we've, just, we've come up with to reliably recover uh, from a catastrophic failure. And whether that's a catastrophic neuron failure or a catastrophic uh, environmental failure, you know, hurricane, earthquake, blah, 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 where you've lost all your methods of connecting to your identity, including your, you know, 12 word mnemonic or whatever the other cases may be. Uh, so the recovery component is a doable thing. And in fact, there are lots of, uh, of, of initiatives out there right now working, uh, working and or uh, in, you know, in beta for recovery that expands beyond just your 12 word phrase or, you know, you, you stored it in a safe and that kind of thing. Uh, so that's there. Uh, let's just for argument's sake, not get down the technical uh, details. There is a recovery component built in and it is a recovery of the core key because everything else is just a link to the core key. Can, can I use that um, as a, a bad actor reset though? I've scammed you all now. I've done my, you know, uh, DeFi. No rug pull and now I want to, I lost my key. I need to recover and become someone else. No, well, uh, you can't do that. Now that's, that's the, that's the real problem that we're facing here is, is that it, it goes back to this thing where um, people don't forgive, right? Which socially is probably net net a bad thing, but uh, because you can lie easily uh, in public now. Hear that. People don't forget. Especially women. No, they don't forgive. They don't forgive. You can remember and forgive. And that's and people can move forward with forgiveness. They cannot move forward if there is uh, no forgiveness. Now, forgetting uh, is effectively lying. If you think about it, from, you know, he forgot that I went to jail and I'm not going to remind him that I went to jail when I apply for this job. <laughs> right. That you can't really do anything about in, 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 in this scenario is that if you've been to jail and you were identifiable on this platform when you went to jail and the court was using this system as its identity management uh, in, internally, then your criminal record is now part of your identity. Whether you disclose it or not is up to you, but and whether somebody who's having a relationship with you asks whether or not you have a criminal record is up to them. But if they ask you whether you have a criminal record or not, you can't say no. You can just say, I don't want a relationship with you. <laughs> right? I think it, it's possible to, to, to have a reset in, in some very special case. Like, for instance, it's possible for, for somebody to change name. Uh, for like, but then your, your you have name, to go to a legal you, process. So it's possible probably like uh, for some reason, if the that doesn't change your identity. Yeah, if the government uh, agrees that, okay, uh, for, uh, I don't know, you, you, I want to protect you and uh, you, I want to change your identity because we want to protect you. So then you can create a new, just create new keys and then the government will tell you, will validate your identity with a new passport and so on. So in, in some cases, I think it's possible. 
I see what you're saying. So you're talking about witness protection concept, right? Yeah, that's an example, yes. Right, okay. So if this is implemented correctly, you don't need witness protection anymore. Your government will change your name. That's fine. Or possibly governments will get together and actually allow people to change their citizenships as well as their name. But because if you had things in your past, for example, that point to you and are connected to people you're trying to run from for whatever reason, you can delete those relationships. Now, that doesn't change the fact that they happened in the past, but it does now mean that nobody who was connected to those relationships can connect with you going forward. But your digital ID doesn't change and your other relationships are still maintainable and it's up to you or possibly an advisor who's talking to you from this government uh, facility to say, you probably don't want to keep those relationships if you want to truly vanish from that world that you were in. But nobody can track you by your digital identity because nobody knows your digital identity. They just know you by the relationship ID and every relationship ID is different. If you're a government, you have a relationship ID with a government and it says that your name is blank. And then the government says, no, we're going to let you, you, you say, I want to change my name. And the government goes, sure. And you change your name. That just changes the name field on your relationship with that government. It doesn't change your identity. But I'm not sure you can delete the, the relationship. I mean, you need to both agree to delete it. Else, I mean, the other no. organization can keep a copy. Uh, they can only keep a copy. Of, well, technically it's on chain, so there will always be a copy there, but it'll be uh, locked, basically. You won't be able to open it if either party deletes it. That was one of the key stipulations for privacy perspective, from a privacy perspective. If, you, if you're connected to the Swiss government, uh, for example, and the Swiss government deletes your identity with them, you are effectively not Swiss anymore. You, on the other hand, can also delete your identity with Switzerland. And if you do that, you're not Swiss anymore either. But the Swiss government still has a pointer to a guy who used to be Swiss, but deleted, but, uh, deleted his relationship. And your record will show that you were Swiss up until this point in time. And then you stop being Swiss. Now, whether or not the Swiss government lets you get away with that, per se, they can put caveats on their relationship engine that says, oh, you can go ahead and delete it, but there's a seven-year time, time hold on it. The banks will be doing this, right? You, can't, you can delete the relationship, which means you can no longer work with us, but we get to keep your record for seven years, right? That's, and that's you'll see on your side, on your self-sovereign ID, you'll see a ticker going down, right? Six years, 364 days, and 12 hours to go. <laughs> That's illegal in some countries. In, in Spain, that's a, a, illegal. You, you, you are Spanish forever. And I think if you are from the USA, you have to pay taxes wherever you live in the world, no matter what. So, right. Very, very yeah. hard. To no, no. Pay. But that's, that's a function of the relationship with each of those governments. Right? They define it. They get to define what the disclosure... James is usually good at dropping wisdom bombs. So, James... Uh, what's your... Question. I have a question, teacher. Um... So I tried to match your shirt, Marco. I couldn't get the exact shade, but but this Coral. is me. It's a Caribbean thing. Me trying to go and you know sympathetic, sympathetic. Okay. So uh, uh, how about how does this intermingle with the concept of avatars and starting to be represented by multiple as, uh, entities, which you know could be you know corporations are are a are a synthetic existence created by, by law, right? So a corporation is a person under the law. So I envision that we're all going to have avatars that are going to be persons uh, that will be in jurisdictions that we choose, some of which may be physical and historic jurisdictions, but others could actually be, you know, uh, in the ether uh, and, you know, uh, and synthetic. Uh, and that we could then have these avatars that could go out and have personalities and histories uh, and form, you know, basically be wallets with with uh, with algorithms that are having them maximize activities for me, you know, very much like the rich do through, you know, through Panama and Switzerland for the last 200 years. Uh, and how would right. that, could, the, could those entities have ID individual uh, and therefore uh, take it away from the corporeal body and, and from your actual acts as a human and more towards what the acts are of those of, of those synthetic individuals? Yes. That's actually easily doable in this model. Uh, if you think of yourself as the principal who owns 
multiple corporations, each corporation having a staff and ownership of one, <laughs> right, which is you. And then you go forward with each of those particular corporations and interact in different worlds. You individually are still accountable for the actions of each of those avatars, but the avatar is the one operating and building its own relationship history with particular ecosystems, right? Virtual ecosystems or physical ecosystems. That's interesting. That's a, that's a good way. That's an interesting way of putting it. Because one of the one of the interesting things about the way the centralized systems have evolved, um, whether it's by necessity or not, um, is that they uh, you are required to surrender information which truthfully is not relevant to the transaction that you're looking to pursue, and then in a lot of ways penalized for having then been transparent. Uh, a perfect example of this is your FICO score, which is ridiculous and just a game that a bunch of corporations made so they can make money. Uh, you know, and then that FICO store then all of a sudden starts showing up in your car insurance rates, uh, you know, and, and in other instances where really it's been shown, you know, statistically that your FICO store has no correlation uh, to the risk that's being assessed. Mm -hmm. And especially for the rich, this will become very popular because you'll be able to spawn multiple, as, as Luke put it, personal DAOs, <laughs> right? You'll be able to spawn multiples of these um and fund them because you got lots of money but, so but the, all of a sudden this is a guy this isn't a guy just walking around with a particular you know avatar picture and an avatar name and an avatar jurisdiction and da, da, da. it's a guy walking around with all that and uh, a thousand bitcoin in his wallet right that right. he's now prepared to go out and do things with so but it's not for the rich. let me just let me just put a little color on that i don't i actually think it's the opposite i think this is the democratization of what the rich has had for the last 250, 300 years since the invention of Swiss banking, um, right? Uh, that, that the rich have been able to choose their jurisdiction, choose their tax rate, uh, and choose the, you know, how their inheritance patterns, et cetera, uh, regardless of, 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 the, of the political nature of where they were born and where they were, how they were supposed to be taxed. And that the, the poor had not had the access to that or, or the, the unbanked and, and the non-wealthy, let's call them. And I think in the future, it'll be, this is gonna be built into a token that costs nothing. Uh, and you'll be able to actually take this uh, process as a service uh, on a, in an in a almost frictionless environment. And therefore you'll be, it's gonna be impossible or very difficult for the existing governments to, to tax and control you because you'll be have the same tools as, as, the, uh, as the wealthy. That's why the wealthy have been doing it. The wealthy have been, have been jurisdiction shopping and tax shopping for, for decades, for centuries. Sure. Yeah, I, 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 I did it myself. I moved to the Cayman Islands, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, you're the, you're the guy. The, you're you're the you're the yeah. You're, you're, I was always wondering. <laughs> I kind of feel like this idea of DAOs you're that guy. Just all makes sense in that as an individual, I could be private by creating these different personas, these avatars that represent myself, as James is describing. And this is kind of the idea again between behind Fio. It's like. You don't have to have Luke at Stokes as your FIO name. It could be gobbledygook, whatever. It could be Peter Pan at, you know, whatever. And, and you have the ability to create these avatars that you control how exposed they are for different relationships. So the relationships themselves in this model is completely kind of this global unique identifier, but we actually do get value out of exposing those publicly to say, yeah, I am a member of whatever. I did graduate from this university. You know, go look at your LinkedIn page. All it is is an exposure of these relationships that benefit you, right? And so when, I, when I'm thinking about this- But you can lie on LinkedIn. I, I think that like, you could still have this private, individual with a public corporation type approach so that as I interact with Marco, I'm like, yeah, it's not good enough to give me your avatar. I actually want to know you as a person. And same with Timothy and Gordon and, and just meeting Alex, you know, it's like, I want to actually connect with people as human beings. So I might reject your avatar, but as a corporation, do I care if you're a human being or you've got a thousand Bitcoin in your wallet? I certainly don't. I care about the thousand Bitcoin. So they might be okay with accepting an avatar relationship because in their particular business model, if that person you know, is a bad actor and leaves, they're like, whatever, it doesn't matter. I can burn that relationship and it doesn't cost me anything. Whereas with like voice.com or sense chat or these other type of, you know, trying to build new social models of interacting with real human beings and not just bots in that context, it's like, yeah, we're not gonna accept an avatar login, for example. And maybe there's a spinoff that does and you get to well, start testing. And this is the problem for with James's model, right? If you go down that road where 
avatars are obviously identifiable as different from real human beings, uh, then you're unfortunately the government where you live. And I, you know, again, my sympathies go out to everyone with an American passport. Um, Thanks. They're not going to accept uh, that avatar. They're going to say, no, 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 that avatar is you. And that avatar is you. And that avatar is you. And you have to disclose all avatars. <laughs> right? Which basically puts you right back in the, in, in the crap again. Well, but again, um, this is the beauty of this system, right? If, if it's actually encrypted and private, I get, you know, as you said earlier, I get to decide which relationships I disclose, even with the government. Now, they might threaten me to put me in a cage if I don't disclose a relationship I have with some entity that they think is bad. But ultimately, or, or as you're fond to say, they, they, they can threaten to nuke you. The, the governments are businesses in that they want tax dollars, right? These jurisdiction shopping, like you're talking about. So I do think there's going to be, I mean, they've already done this with Citizens United. It's like this idea that you can be a company and have personhood as far as the government's concerned. And, and so I, I think it's an example of that, right? Yeah, well, that's true. Exactly. But, you know, as, as for example, the Cayman Company thing is a, is a great thing. You now find out that if you're an American citizen and you open up a Cayman Company and you start doing tax-free business, the profits of that company accrue to you as personal income because it's American-owned. It's deemed as, American, uh, as an American company for tax purposes, there's a way, if there's it's American-owned. There's, there's ways around that. But yes, that is the general but don't idea. have American ownership. <laughs> Thanks, go on. I mean, I mean the, the, one of the things is that as we move towards a decentralized global society and economy, um, that you start to go towards the truth without trusting concept. And, you know, is identity actually relevant or is re what's relevant, whether you act, going back to the property law question that, that uh, Gordon and I talked about earlier, which is, you know, uh, I can, you can only take from me what I have to give. And so when you're doing a transaction, is it, relative, is, it rel is it relevant whether or not I'm a felon or not? Or do you just care if I have the digital asset in my wallet? And do you want to trade this for that? And the, the issue of getting beyond that for information doesn't have to do with the transaction or security. It has to do with morality, right? It has to do with people trying to impose other filters on my relationship with others to fulfill their guide. So, uh, so they'll come up with BS about how crypto funds terrorism, which is just the dumbest thing you could ever hear, right? Um, or, you know, a government's fund terrorism by the guys, if anyone cares. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the, the idea that you need that other data is not about the transaction. It's not about the need of the actual individuals. It's about trying to add moral and ethical layers or political layers on top of the, the relationship to control it. And in essence, people have heard me talk before, it's the, it's the most uh, basic form of censorship. Cens censorship. If you try and if you try and change who I can deal deal with, how I can hold my money, and how I can make transactions, then what you're really doing is 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 censoring my free will. Because how I spend my money is the easiest and most you know visible example of the exercise of my free will. All right, so I was just thinking about Great. that. It's it, it, the, the moral way that we interact with each other, we censor ourselves all the time. We're like, that guy is a jerk. I'm not going to, I'm going to mute him. I'm not going to, you know, we have self-sovereign control over that censorship process. Cause I agree with you. It's a good framework to think about it, but it's also a concern in that, like when an exchange gets hacked as a moral person, do I want to take that Bitcoin? That's wow. 20% discount. That's amazing. I wonder why it's so cheap. Sure. I'll buy that token. Or do I want to have an ability to go, no, that's actually my brother's Bitcoin because he was on that exchange and he just got hacked and he got his money stolen. I don't want to buy that. I want that guy held accountable for trying to sell it to me, right? There is a moral component for how we interact with each other. And I, well, it, like we're saying- well, that moral, this can go there's, there's a moral component if you, but, but, but honestly, there's a moral component, but it's easily stripped away and not really part of your transaction, right? So you, the, the idea that, you know, that, that someone else can tell you that you can't take that, they're telling you, like the term hacking right there, I understand the, the, the social contract and, and, the, and, the, and the legal constructs which, which make the hack illegal, but in different societies and in different, uh, uh, in, in different establishments, it would be, you know, what, what's mine is mine and what's, you know, what's yours is mine. And, uh, and, and that's, you know, the law of the jungle. Uh, and so the guy, you know, and that possession becomes nine tenths of the law, which argumentally it already is. Um, 
So, you know, I, I actually don't buy the argument that, you know, that I care about where it came from. At the end of the day, I, I think that 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 once again, once you go over that first toe over that line, that it just opens the Pandora's box of all the different things you need to consider. Uh, and so I think we need to reconsider all those terms and all those bases of morality. Like Mark Twain would say, there's no such thing as good and bad. There just is. Winnie the Pooh would say it also, by the way. But oh, yeah. So, but to pick it. Yeah. Now, the, the, the key thing I get a giggle out of, and this has been going on since they started arguing about this back in the late 70s, um, is that the idea of, I mean, in the 70s, it was impossible to do because barely anybody had credit cards and uh, everything was done with cash and you just couldn't trace money. But the minute money tracing became possible, it became the default way that surveillance was done, that to catching criminals was done, and they justified it because, well, you know, we're catching criminals with it. And really, it's not a good justification. And they, of course, have been helping along, they being the governments of the world, helping along the move to digitization of all money, monetary transactions so that they can literally control us because they can watch every transaction we do and they can start saying, well, this kind of transaction is that. And because we're watching all transactions, we'll know when you do one. And as James says, that's fundamentally, that is the, almost the last straw for taking us from a reasonably free society to a dictatorship by committee, but a very small committee. Guys, we're, we're, we're coming up on two hours. This one's flown by, especially because I didn't have to do much. Um, <laughs> you had lots of coffee too. Marco, you, you mentioned a couple of times, the, what, what's, your, what's your business? And you, you dropped in there teams and all this other stuff. Like what, what's, your, what's your day job? Um, well, I have several currently, <laughs> but the one that's uh, key. Yeah, aside from talking to you about law all day, um, uh, I guess um, my primary my primary gig is uh, Block Blocks, which it's on my LinkedIn profile, um, and it is a software development company that designs, starting with the philosophies, moving into the product, and then into the actual core, where we actually build blockchains. Uh, most recent one being Anatha.io, uh, which launched four weeks ago, and we're in the middle of doing a whole bunch of post-launch uh, upgrades to the network to add more functionality that they've, they've asked for. Uh, but it's a, basically, we took Cosmos Tendermint and ripped it apart, fixed it, uh, not fixed in the sense of Cosmos Tendermint fixed, but fixed in the terms of made it do what their economic model uh, needs, which was a significant departure from what uh, standard point, uh, proof of stake networks do. And we built that up and we've launched it uh, and uh, we're now working with them very closely to continually evolve the program. And uh, at the risk of probably breaking an NDA, but I don't think so, there are several CBDC projects uh, that are looking at them as a foundational platform for launching a CBDC. Very good. I like it. Um, Fun games. Sandra, uh, I, I just chatted you, but I'm, I'm just going to put you on the spot. Are you in a position to talk about your new gig? Just drop a couple lines in there, or is that next week's thing? No, that's going to be next week. Next week's thing. And I already got some questions for for people that were on today's call because I asked everybody. Let's also also connect on LinkedIn because this is also a networking community. Mm -hmm. Some of you are asking. I see a new project, Europe Chain. What's what's that? It's going to be a teaser. Maybe next week. Exciting project. But I, I don't want to disturb on everything that, that Marco and Luke and Alex brought into today's show, which Fair I think enough. was fantastic. And two hours flew by really fast. So maybe- You didn't have maybe, to do anything. This is great. I've got oh. coffee. I, I took care of my cats. I listened. I learned something new. This is cool. <laughs> so so maybe a final note from your side, looking looking forward to next week. Do we- you know? yes, uh, Next week, we got a friend of mine, uh, Jacob Stein. He's an asset protection attorney, which I think is a good follow-on to- Marco being in the Caymans, he's very clever. He's very good. He approaches it from a U.S. perspective, but his he's ex Soviet Union. He's got a worldwide understanding. He helps people come into the U.S. when they have investments. They people exit. They you know all kinds of situations, whether it's tax planning, <laughs> marriage planning, business planning. He's a sharp cookie. So I'm going to be deploying that. And actually, we have the guests for the next several weeks lined up. We got some backlog happening, which is good. 
Um, yeah, and then I, I, I guess that's it. Have a wonderful Wednesday. And I, I, maybe tomorrow we'll know who our president is for us Americans. Yeah. Alex, Luke, thank you very much for, for uh, getting in and uh, bringing your insights. Yeah, guys, great job. Marco, fantastic panel. Alex, would like to get you better. Luke, get to know you better. Luke, I feel like I know you well, but there's always more to learn. And I wanted to thank all our alumni speakers. I want to thank Tim Lewis and Jim and James and Alex, we got to get you in here and just everyone. It was, it was good. So, Sandra, shall we wrap it up? Yeah, uh, the, the, maybe as a final note for everyone that's not attending our Telegram channel yet, please go to Telegram, look for Crypto Wednesdays, join our channel, share the, 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 the Zoom link for next week. And we look forward to having this same group, the same community at the same time, same uh, Zoom link next week again. So thank you all for participating. We really appreciate that. And we wish you all a good week and stay healthy, guys. Thanks, excellent panel. Thanks, guys. Good job, Marco. Bye. Yo.